there's a sense of comfort that you get right away when you cross over certain martial arts. Hello and welcome to the show. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 360. Today, I'm joined by Sifu Glenn Doyle. My name is Jeremy. I'm the founder at Whistlekick. I'm your host on the show. And martial arts is a huge part of my life. So huge that it became my career. You can check out all the things that we work on at Whistlekick. Many of those things I am personally involved in over at whistlekick.com. Don't forget, if you buy something, use the code PODCAST15. Saves you 15%. It's a thank you from us to you. And honestly, lets us know that this podcast is worth doing. Because let's face it, this is a business. And you've got to make some money somewhere. Because I need to eat. Not a lot, but I do need to eat something. Here we are, 360 episodes in, and we're still finding new martial arts to talk about. Did you know that there were Irish martial arts traditions? Well, today's guest not only has family lineage through Irish martial arts, but also something that most of us would consider more contemporary, more conventional in that Kung Fu. So we not only get to talk about each of those arts, but the contrast, the similarities between the two, and the wonderful story that unfolds as Sifu Doyle talks about his life and his navigation through both of those arts and what it meant to him and his family. So hold on, listen, and learn something. Sifu Doyle, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. I'm happy to have you here. Now, Listeners, this this was one we were we were chatting just before we started the episode that we, I think we were both afraid that this might be the episode that didn't happen. There were a number of power outages on both ends. It was crazy. I've had issues with with my with losing power here. I've had issues with guests losing power there. I don't think we've ever had an episode scheduled for a time where both sides lost power. <laughs> I like to respond like an echo. <laughs> awesome. But we're here. We're here now, and I, I appreciate I appreciate your flexibility in rescheduling. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Great. Well, let's start the way we start. Martial arts show. We need some background. We need some some basics. We need to learn how to make a fist and and punch, as it were, with who you are. So, how did you find martial arts? Um, well, I mean, I was more or less. Uh, not to sound melodramatic, but I was kind of born into it. Um, my dad was a boxer um, and he boxed uh, for a number of years, mostly when he was in the Canadian Armed Forces, but um, he was always boxing. And so I started, um, he started me, whether I wanted to or not. <laughs> um, in 1969, when I was four years old, we put on um, the boxing gloves and I got my first lesson and um, uh, went on till, you know, however long dad was alive. Uh, he started me in boxing and then in 70, 1972, he started me in stick fighting. And then I wanted to branch out and learn other styles and stuff. So in and around 1980, 1981, I branched out and joined a uh, Chinese Kung Fu club in Toronto. And uh, I stayed with that club until uh, my Sifu, Sifu Lord Ging Hong passed away in uh, 2008. Um, and uh, so basically from 1969 to present, has been my martial art path, but I got basically involved in it when my dad uh, started punching at me and didn't give me a choice but to punch back. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow! All right, so you you've got a couple different things going on, a, a few different martial arts, mm -hmm. and one of the things that I find personally fascinating is how people start to relate those back to each other. Right. So, what what does that look like for you? Um, well, I mean, you could, if I wanted to, like, if I go into like boxing and if comparing boxing and Kung Fu, I mean, a punch is a punch, no matter how you do it. Um, there's just going to be a different way of explaining it or a different way of executing it. But at the end result's the same. You're trying to hit something. Um, the, com the, the comparisons that I always was a little more interested in was, um, the stick fighting style that my dad taught me was from our family. It's an Irish stick fighting style. And um, when I branched out and, you know, 
explored the other martial arts, you know, being the Kung Fu. And then I dabbled in um, some Filipino stick fighting. Um, I just thought it was really interesting. The diff, the, the, the geographically, the two countries, Ireland and, and Philippines are so far apart, but when you put a stick in a hand, you know, there's going to be some principles that are going to be very similar and some are going to be completely different. Um, so I was always, uh, amazed at, um, the way the footwork might be explained differently, but the end result's the same. And sometimes the footwork looks almost the same. Um, so, you know, it just, it reiterates and it just uh, emphasizes to me that, you know, if you got two legs and two arms or, you know, you're basically a human being, you're only going to move a certain way so many times or a certain way uh, so many different times and things are going to cross over. So as a martial artist, when I, when I branched out into other arts that weren't culturally the same as mine, um, there was a nice uh, kind of camaraderie built up in my mind right away because it was like, wow, this isn't so different. I am not in such a foreign land after all. This is great. And there's a sense of comfort that you get right away when you cross over certain martial arts. Um, when you find the similarities, it's like you're home, but you're, you're not here. You're on the road, but you're home. It's like, you know, when you go traveling, you take a big suitcase and you want to have a lot of your stuff around you, even though you're in a, a, a bizarre place or a different place, you know, you have a bit of a comfort because you got some items from your home that make you feel a little more comfortable. And I think when you cross over and, and you know, uh, cross over and do different martial arts together, that familiarity is what um, makes you feel comfortable and, and allows you to really open your learning curve and really kind of accept the techniques more readily, more instinctually, rather than just um, kind of forcing a square peg into a round hole, if that makes any sense. Mm. It certainly does. It certainly does. I've spent a bit of time doing some Filipino stick work, and, and I would imagine that 90% of the folks listening who have engaged in stick work have done it through some kind of Filipino Iskrima Arnis, you know, Southeast Asian tradition. Mm -hmm. You said that you had done some. So are you able to relate to us? The, the, I expect a lot of similarities, but where are the differences? Um, well, I mean, the style of Filipi the Filipino style that I dabbled in, when I say dabbled, please understand, I'm not professing um, that I studied it a long time or I'm really super sure, proficient. Sure. Um, but I dabbled in it in the fact that I did it off and on for a number of years because one of the, um, instructors at the Kung Fu club that I was training, um, was from Cebu city in the Philippines. And, uh, anytime he was, uh, teaching a class, if I had, if I had the, the, the time to do it, I would jump in and, and play around with it. Um, it, uh, it was called, um, Arnis, uh, uh, it was, um, La Punte Arnista Abenico. There you go. Sorry. Um, and um, it, uh, uh, Abenico, I believe, is fan style, if I'm not mistaken. And it, uh, it's a single hand uh, uh, stick fighting style, which is the biggest difference between what I was taught with from my dad, which was two handed. Um, and um, and uh, the, uh, the stick uh, is a lot longer in the Irish system. Um, a little heavier uh, because it's a black thorn, the heavier wood, where the Filipino system is using the rattan. Um, a lot of whirling strikes in the Filipino systems, uh, very fast, explosive. Um, and uh, I found that uh, I liked the, the way that uh, the multiple quick hits, the, the, the rapid hits in the Filipino systems was something I really loved. I was just, it was so different um, from the Irish stuff. So I was... Uh, I was like a kid in the candy store when I first played around with it. So <laughs> nice. It, it it almost um, you know, I, I have some some Irish roots. In fact, my, my father lives just outside of Cork. And, um I've I've used some blackthorn sticks. And I mean they're they're durable, they're heavy. So is the is the stick fighting tradition that you that you come from that you're passing on, is there some synergy there with like bladed weapons? Um, no, no. The okay. uh, the only connection to bladed weapons is um, basically um, the Irish stick fighting came to be simply because of penal laws and whatnot. The you know Irish uh, citizens, um, especially the peasants, uh, weren't allowed access to weapons. 
Um, and a lot of, a lot of Irishmen fought in foreign armies, um, in the 17, 1800s and they learned fencing, they learned sword play in the foreign armies. So when they came back, um, that's all they had to draw upon, but because they didn't have access to bladed weapons, they used the stick and, you know, they had to, you know, adapt the slashing and stabbing motions from war, you know, thumping and striking. Um, so the only kind of, you know, influence in any kind of bladed, uh, weapon would be the way the, the system was approached because most, um, well, all at one point, all Irish stick fighting systems were one handed, um, based on sword play, but with a stick in your hand. And then, um, somewhere in, in my family line, my great, 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 great uncle, I think I go back five or six generations. He was a pugilist and he decided to put two hands on the stick and, uh, the stick was then, you know, parallel to the ground horizontal. Um, and it changed, uh, the way we approach the stick fighting. Um, so any kind of access or, uh, comparison to bladed weapons kind of really disappeared when that happened. And now, um, the pugilists of the boxing influence kind of took over. Um, it became a much more close quarter kind of thing where you had to get in, uh, close, which, you know, when you have a stick, you want to keep the, the opponent on the end of your stick. So, you know, you want to have them on that last six to eight inches for maximum velocity. And then, you know, here's something my dad taught me where it's like, close in, close in. It's like, but I have this long stick. Why do I want to close in? You know, but, um, that would probably be the only, uh, if I could, you know, really say any kind of bladed, but there's no other weapons in the system. I learned from my dad. It's just the black thorn. That's it. No knives, no, no nothing else. So, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. I'm going to have to, find some video. Do you have video? Like, are, are, is there video? Of, yeah, I, I have a, I have thing? a, I have a bunch of stuff up on YouTube, just, collage, okay, just cool. collage stuff. Me teaching some seminars. It's not instructional. It's just kind okay. of collage you to set to some music just so I had a website for a while when, um, I had to get permission from my dad to teach it outside the family. And that was the whole story in itself. And I had a website up and it had just had pictures on it. And I got a lot of, emails and a lot of communication from people. And I mean, because, you know, you can't tell much from a picture. You can only tell so much. And a lot of the feedback, I'm not going to go into it was like, Oh my God, this, but this, and I would do this and you would, you know, and it was all this kind of stuff. And I'm, and I just kind of let it roll off my back for a couple of years. And then I, and then um, I said, you know what, maybe I'll just put something on YouTube just so people can see the move, the motion and the movement. And maybe that'll help them understand the, the pictures they're seeing. And so I, you know, I put up a couple of videos um, and it was the exact opposite than the feedback I got. People were like, oh, that's how it works. Or, oh, you know, and, and you, you, you know, it, um, it was definitely the right thing to do because you kind of got to see the, the style to understand it. And then, you know, um, now I find that people uh, are really, you know, the, it really launches more questions, but they're, they're more listening with excitement rather than derision. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And it was all, it was all because I put a few videos up. So I did that just so people could get a sense of how it looked and how it moved. And, um, and I find a lot of Filipino stick fighters actually um, are the most interested. They, they, they love uh, watching it and they, they, they make their, their uh, observations and similarities pop up and the differences. And, it's usually a really nice interaction when I, when I talk to Filipino stick fighters, they usually have really, really interesting questions about uh, certain techniques in the style and, and how this came to be and how that came to be. And, and then of course they'll bring up, wow, it's very similar to what we do. And then it's kind of like, uh, you know, two kids talking over a, a couple of toys that they have that are uh, very similar. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. 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 And those are some of my favorite conversations with martial artists and it's, I think those conversations are more enlightening, more productive, more enjoyable when you start from a place of similarity. Of course, yes. Rather than a place of, of difference. And I mean, I, I can, you know, I'm trying to think of something that I, 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 I haven't done martial arts wise. Kung Fu might be the furthest from what I've done as, as a complete style. But I can sit down and I can talk with a Kung Fu practitioner and we can start from what do we have in common? We can have a lot of fun. We can maybe even, you know, share, spar and have a good time. Or we can start from differences, which tend to be philosophical and 
that doesn't help anybody. No, no. <laughs> Usually, uh, well, it sets the tone, right? Because I think when you when you come from a, a, a place of similarity, then the camaraderie is right. It's built right in. Um, if, you, if you come from a sense of difference, there's always this this little underlying tone of, are you saying your style's better? Right. Because it's so different. Like what, I mean, I've studied this. I know my style really well. Why are you saying yours is better? And it's like, you're not saying that, but if you're, if you're coming at them from the differences and people tend to lean towards that, it seems to be kind of human nature. Well, what's wrong with my style? What do you mean your style is different? What do you, what do you start <laughs> when you, when you, when you come at the, the other person from the point of, wow, we do this. It's very similar to what you do. All of a sudden, you know, um, they, they listen with their ears wide open rather than looking for reasons to be offended. Right. That's, that's been my kind of take on it. And, um, when I teach seminars, you know, I always have my opening speech and I always say, you know, I don't denigrate or take away from any other style. And, um, I always say that I'm saying that we do it this way. I'm not saying it's better or worse than what you do. I'm just saying we're different. And that seems to really actually set the tone for the seminar. And I, you know, knock on wood, I haven't had any issues at this point. So that's great. Yeah. Good. We'll make sure to link the YouTube channel over on the show notes for, for this. And for folks that might be new, if you came in, if this is your first episode, we put the show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Now you, a few minutes ago, mentioned a conversation that you had to have with your father to get permission to teach this, this stick fighting style outside of the family. Mm-hmm. Would you be willing to share that? Sure. What that was yeah. Like? Um, yeah. Well, I mean, the system was only passed on through the family. So you have to, have, you had to have the surname Doyle to learn it. And they were very strict about that. And Irish traditions, oral, tr- oral tradition is very, very uh, predominant in Irish culture. A lot of times it's because, um, you know, the occupying forces wanted to kind of diffuse the culture. They wanted to stop the language, anything to do with, uh, you know, individuality or, or pride in your country or where you're from. They, they, you know, they want to kind of, kind of take that away. You know what I mean? And Mm. so to preserve certain cultural aspects of the country, a lot of things were, you know, taught in secret or behind closed doors or secret meetings and whatnot. And that included language and music and whatnot. So the the stick fighting was no different. Um, And it was passed on, you know, father to son uh, through the family. And if you didn't have the last name Doyle, you didn't learn it. And um, because, you know, the stick fighting styles could differentiate between families they could differentiate between counties or towns. So you, you could have a town that had this, uh, one stick fighting style. You could have a county that, that had it. Then you had the factions, um, you know, the, from like Tipperary and, and, uh, and from Wicklow and Wexford and whatnot. You had the Yellow Bellies. You had the, the Neans. You had the um, – there's a, there's a bunch of names that you could give. So they would have the similar style. But anyway, um, so ours was based on family name. And, um, it was passed on and my dad was very strict about it when, um, he taught it to me. Um, we spend most of our weekends, um, you know, he was, he had a full-time job. He's an iron worker, so he didn't have a lot of time during the week, but on the weekends we'd be doing the boxing and the sticks. And he was, you know, he would always reiterate, you know, this is ours. You keep it to yourself kind of thing. And eventually after being in, uh, the Kung Fu Club for a, a number of time. Like my my Chinese instructor, my Chinese the Kung Fu instructor, Sifu Lor, he was so open um, uh, because he wanted to share his culture with everyone. And he was amazing that way. And I, it really rubbed off of me. So I started to say to my dad, you know, this is such a cool little system, you know, and I'm your only son and you're teaching it to me. But if I, you know, walk down the street tomorrow and get hit by a car and get killed, it's done. It's gone. And that really bothered me. So I, I, you know, I started to ask my dad in the early nineties, you know, can I start showing some guys down at the club, just some, some stuff. And he was adamant. No. And my dad, to give you a sense of my dad, uh, just so you can get his kind of mindset the way he was, um, just a little capsule thing of his, his personality. Um, he, um, forged my granddad's signature to join the Canadian military with six, when he was 16. Uh, he lied about his age and he spent his 17th and 18th birthdays on the front lines in Korea. Wow. And he summed up his personality with this. And I'm going to keep it clean for the listeners, 
And if it's offensive to some people, I do apologize, but it was what he said to me because he was really hard man. And I always used to say to him, I'm like, you're really hard on people. You speak your mind, but you know, so you come off rough. And he said, you have to understand me because you know, I killed my first man before I ever slept with my first woman. And that kind of summed up my dad for me. And I mean, there's no part of my, you know, you can edit that out too, if you find it, if, if it's not appropriate, I have no, no absolutely that. not. We're, but I think um, that's pretty important. <laughs> it, it really set his tone for me because I can't even wrap my head around that. No matter how much I try that, that sense of what he must have went through at 16, 17 and 18 years of age. I, I always gave him a wild, wide berth after that. I always try to step back and, and understand because, you know, he, uh, he was very straight edge. He was very straightforward and he said what he said. And if he didn't like it, he really didn't care. So, um, so going back to saying, you know, dad, I really want to kind of share this with some of the guys at the club, just a few guys at the club, my closest friends. No, it was, it was adamant. And then in, uh, 19, Late 1997, early 1998, he got diagnosed with metastatic colon cancer. And he was only given a couple of months. And, um, you know, we spent all the time together. I was very, very fortunate that I got to do everything I needed to do for closure. And the fact that I got to have my last talk with him, I got to hold his hand. I was there when he took his last breath. I mean, the, the relationship that I had with my dad, if I wasn't there, it, it probably would have driven me insane that I didn't get the goodbye. So I was very fortunate um, that I was allowed to share those times. And we talked about a lot of things. And the, the one thing that I brought up again was I really want to teach this outside the family. Um, you know, I don't have any children of my own. So, you know, again, the, the style is, is in danger of just becoming extinct. If I, you know, pass on and don't, and don't teach anyone. And it took a lot of talking, but it finally near our last talk before he went on the morphine and couldn't talk anymore because he was in so much pain. He finally um, gave me permission. And uh, if he had not, you and I would be having a completely different conversation right now. We'd just be talking about Kung Fu. So, mm. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was very grateful that he eventually relented. Uh, now, do I think he was happy about it? I couldn't really say. But all I know is he did give me the permission and, and whether it was his last act of, of love or not, I don't know. But at, at the end of the day, he gave me his permission to teach it outside the family. And I, uh, after, you know, we had his service and I, I had his ashes and I spread his ashes over our land. We're from Newfoundland originally. And um, I started to slowly, you know, um, get the style out there. Uh, I mean, I... I had an, an interview in Inside Kung Fu, and I think it was 1995. Um, and I got into the moment. Like, the, the journalist was really, really good. He, he really uh, played me really well, for lack of a better term. Anyway, and I, and I blurted out, this, you know, the Irish stick fighting. And then I immediately, you know, stopped talking about it. But he did mention it in the article. And... Um, the bally rag and I got from my dad about that. Let me tell you, that went on for a couple of years. So uh, I learned my lesson. But yeah, he um, he basically gave me permission just before he passed away. So um, there's a sentimentality there when I teach as well. Um, it's like he's in the room with me, which I love, and you know it helps me. Uh, it helps me cope. I mean, he's been gone since '98, but it just it doesn't seem like it seems like yesterday to me. I still think about him all the time, and and the sticks is a way for me to kind of revisit our time together and stuff so it it's there's a real uh there's a real emotional sentimentality to me teaching it now when those of us that that came up in i i guess i think of it as asian traditions you know when i, when I think of the quintessential kung fu style or karate style quite often there's a family dynamic mm -hmm. you know some kind of, of splinter there but i haven't had the opportunity to speak with someone who came from that close guarded family tradition of a martial art so forgive me as i'm asking you some of these questions that i've always wondered knowing that you know you don't speak for everyone but you're 
You're the best I have. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Why? Why was your father so resistant to, to people learning this family style? I think it was just the cultural way. It was just cultural and the way he was raised. Um, again, uh, with it being guarded and um, not wanting to uh, basically, I, like self-preservation, really. I mean, you always want that. If, if everybody knows your style, then the, the, the percentages of being able to counter you go up. And, sure. you know, if, you know, every system that you've ever come across is one-handed, and all of a sudden you come up against this guy who all of a sudden, you know, he starts one handed and all of a sudden drops his, his stick into his other hand and comes at you from a pugilistic, you know, horizontal based stick pattern. It's going to throw you. And I think that element of surprise, you know, ups the, the, the success factor. So I think it was a combination of it was tradition. It was it was the way he was taught. And my granddad was probably exactly like my dad, a no nonsense Irishman. You know, do what I say and don't question, <laughs> you know, and I think that coupled with the fact that technically you'd like to have a surprise or two in your back pocket. I think the combination of those two things in the formula is probably why he was so adamant. Um, and, you know, because when I would explain to my dad how if Sifu Lor said, oh, I only teach Chinese, I wouldn't have been learning this amazing stuff that he was teaching me. Um, I could see my dad understanding what I was saying, but I just, the stubbornness of no, we don't share it because, you know, of whatever reason, I could see there was a wall up for the longest time. And I'd be lying to you if I said I understood it. Um, but it's just, I think it was, for lack of a better term, the programming, it was just the way he was raised. And he kept it um, uh, without being, uh, what's the word? He, not pure, but he just didn't want, he wanted it untainted. And when you get a style and you, and you put it out in, into the public domain, it gets changed right away. People are going to adapt it to what they think the movement should be or the way they would do it or the, the strategically how they think it works for them. And all of a sudden the style ceases to become that movement or that, that uh, way of, of uh, executing a technique that's been passed on for generation and generation. And it mean, he was big on not changing the techniques because like my dad said, the, the, the system was like, and I think he was talking about all fighting systems, but when he's pertaining to our stick system, he said it was born on a battlefield. And through evolution and through faction fights, techniques that didn't work, you got your head bashed in, you knew they didn't work, they didn't get passed on. And he said, you know, nowadays, everybody likes to change everything, but most of the people changing the stuff aren't, you know, haven't fought to save their lives. Mm. It's theory or they're, you know, they got padded equipment on, so they're not getting punished for their mistakes or it's a game of tag. And, and again, I'm not coming down on anybody who spars or anything like that. It's not what I'm saying. I'm saying what he said to me and he said, why would you change something that has been proven? But because, you know, you know, you're, you're in modern day society and now it's like, well, this is faster or flashier and, and, and whatnot or whatnot, but it's just a theory. Um, so he was, I think part of the thing he was worried that if I put it out there into, into the general populace, it was going to get changed a lot, but it would still have our name on it. Mm. And he said, you know, if someone changes it and the technique doesn't work, it's still got our name on it. And they go out and try to use the technique and they get their head bashed in. Well, our name takes the hit. Um, so that was kind of his kind of approach. And um, I think that's one of the reasons he was really adamant, uh, aside from the fact that it was tradition that it was just taught to Doyle's. And I think he wanted to, you know, he wanted something to pass on to his son that was just for me, I guess. You know, there could have been a father son dynamic there that I wasn't picking up on, you know, um, I, uh, because I was all about just, I loved it so much. I just wanted to share it with everyone, you know, um, <laughs> a little bit, of, a little bit of family pride, you know, and, you know, pride can, pride's a double-edged sword, <laughs> you know, 
Um, it certainly is. Um, and so I think uh, that maybe he was trying to dissuade me from that. And, and, you know, I've been teaching it outside the family now since just after he passed away. So it's been like 98, so about 20 years. Um, and all the stuff he said has happened. It's been changed. It's been this, it's been that. So he wasn't wrong. You know, I've, 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 uh, you know, had to walk away and, and discontinue associations with a lot of people because of, of what happened that mm. dad said would, um, sadly. So, you know, I have to kind of tip my cap to him because he wasn't wrong, but on the, other side of the coin is I've met some amazing people and I've passed it on and they're amazing. So on the other side of the coin, I was right. Right. You know, so. Can you talk a little bit more about the stuff he was right about these, you know, I'm not asking you to name names or, or identify anything so clearly that oh, people could infer names. Yeah, No, but... no, I, I, I wouldn't do that anyway, but um, it just basically what would happen is, um, a lot of people would come under the the guise of, oh, I want to learn it the way you learned it. I want it to stay traditional and I want to learn it and then pass it on and whatnot. And really what they wanted to do was they wanted to up the cachet of their school by saying they offered Irish stick fighting. So it was more of a business thing. And what they would do is they would just take certain elements that they liked that um, they liked from the system and they would incorporate it into what they already taught. So if I did a numbered system, so let's say I taught a sequence or there's a technique that let's say has five movements in a sequence. This is like, I'll try to be really kind of basic here. Um, and then we go movement one, two, three, four, five, and they take the movement. Well, movement one and two would be from the Doyle system. And then movement three, four, and five would be from where, what they learned. So it, it would become a hybrid and it would get infused. And then what happened is it started to, uh, then the people they, they taught would then change a little bit when they started. So, you know, two or three um, students or two or three lessons down the road, it didn't even look anything like what I had taught them, yet it still had our family name on it. Right. And, um, and you can, you'll see it when you, if you search Doyle Stick Fighting, you'll find a number of videos on YouTube aside from mine, and you'll see. If you have martial art eyes, you'll see exactly what I'm talking. Um, and I don't deny anybody that I've trained. If someone wrote to me and said, blah, 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 says he's, and I will not lie. I'll say, yep, he learned under me. Uh, but I will also say, um, but he has changed it a little bit. So the stuff he's teaching is influenced or has a flavor of what I taught, but it's more um, what they've done to hybridize it. So I'm very honest, but I, I don't deny anybody I've ever worked with, even if I no longer uh, teach them, I will still say, yep, they learned under me. They came to a seminar. I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, um, you know, cut off my, uh, my connection to them that way. Cause I don't think that's fair. Um, they did put in the time. I just, uh, I just want to try to keep the style out there the way it was taught to me. So if somebody comes to me or goes to somebody and wants to learn, what was taught back in Ireland, hopefully they can find somebody who does that, not somebody's version of a version of a version who's done that. Mm. Because some it people want that, that, they want that authentic style. Some people really do. And then others are fine use, learning the hybrid stuff. They're, they're fine with it. And that's uh, all fair to them. I have no problem with that. But when your name's attached to it, when you're, and, and again, you know, because of the sentimentality and the emotional connection to my dad, I, you know, I won't lie. There's a little chip on my shoulder about it. Uh, some days it bothers me more, bothers me more than others, but I've learned to live with it now. And now when I teach, I'm very um, particular when I teach people one-on-one -on -one, um, in person. I, uh, I've just started doing an online course I'm on Vimeo. I'm going to test that out and see how that plays out. But um, you know, I don't want to, because of a couple of bad experiences, I don't want to just say I'm not teaching anymore because that defeats the purpose as well. Um, I don't think that's fair to people who want to learn it. So I'm trying to find that. It's like, it's, you're trying to walk that tightrope, right? And you're going to have to make some concessions, which I learned that I had to. And at the same time, you, you know, 
every once in a while, you're going to find that one or two or three or four people that are just going to take it the way it was given to you. And they're going to treat it that way. And they're going to make sure it stays uh, authentic and how it was passed on. And those are the victories that I take. And then all the other ones, I got to spend some time with uh, different people and different personalities. And I, I choose to take the positive away rather than the negative. Um, because if I keep the negative, man, I'll just be, uh, I'll just be the grumpiest person in the world. And I don't want that. So. <laughs> I get it. I get it. No, I, I can, I can completely see what you're talking about. Makes, makes, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, the idea that it's not just a martial art, it's your lineage. It's your, it's your tie to your father. It's so many things. And, and I don't think anyone else is going to be able to fully embrace that, even if they intellectually understand it. Yeah, it's a, it, uh, yeah, it's, it's tough to put into words. Um, and uh, when I, when I, when it first happened, when, the, when it first started to get changed and, and whatnot, I was livid and, you know, I have the Irish temper like everybody else and, <laughs> and the family. Um, and, you know, my initial reactions were, were, uh, very, you know, cut off the, the nose to spite my face kind of thing. Um, and then I learned that that's not going to do anything. And I had to kind of adapt and, and take more of a, a philosophical approach to it and just see where they were coming from and, and walk a mile in their shoes just to kind of wrap my head around it. And then it kind of eased the, it eased the blow a little bit. <laughs> if that makes any sense. Sure does. Yeah. Now, I'm sure that you, you almost have walls up to make sure that the Kung Fu is not influencing the stick fighting. But I'm guessing that you don't have the same rule going the other way. So how does the stick fighting influence your Kung Fu? Um, I, again, going back to the beginning when we started talking, the, the thing about the stick and the Kung Fu, it was all about the similarity. And, um, but also the way I teach the sticks, my dad was very, um, he taught what he felt like that day. He had a system, like he had a, a, an agenda of how to teach it, but it wasn't so, uh, evident. Like, I think he would get me to go over some stuff that he taught me the week before and then based on what I did incorrectly or what I did correctly, that would shape what we would work on that day. Um, when I started to teach it, I found that the way I taught it was very much influenced by the way I learned Kung Fu. Meaning you learn your stances, you learn, you know, your foundations, boom, 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 boom. Where, you know, my dad taught me, I got stances and whatnot, but he got me into the stick punches and, and he got me into what the hand was doing. And, and I, I know I'm using a lot of terms that people are kind of not going to understand because they don't know the style, but he got me chasing the stick and, you know, crashing the gates and all these things. But I think if he had more of a system in place, I probably would have learned it quicker because it took a while. Cause I mean, I was only seven when I started. Right. So, but I find that the Kung Fu influenced me in the way I taught the sticks because I, for lack of, a better word. I systemized it in the fact that I did stances for all footwork, footwork, footwork. Cause dad was really big on footwork. Um, but I think even though he was big on footwork, he kept throwing other things at me just to kind of keep the ball rolling in what he, in what his mind, I was, it, it, it was like, I was learning at a pace that he was happy with. Whereas for when I teach, uh, you know, if you don't get your stances and your footwork, you're not learning anything else. You're going to be holding the stick forever, doing nothing with it because it's all going to be from the waist down. And that's very Kung Fu. Stances, stances, stances. Strong horse, strong punch. That's it. That's the two things you need before you do anything else. And I, I adapted that for when I taught. Um, the similarities between uh, the footwork was very interesting because we have a, a thing in our style because it comes from fencing footwork. Um, initially, and then with the boxing influence, the heels are a little different. And when we step, we step down heel toe, and then we what we call we drag um, the back leg um, to when we're advancing. And I found it so amazing because in the Hongar style of Gung Fu that I learned, 
it's almost exactly the same. Mm. When you step from a cat stance, you step down heel toe and then you pop back into your horse stance. And if I had to explain the stepping in the Irish stick fighting and the stepping in Kung Fu, if I used heel toe drag, it works the exact same for both styles. So the influence, if you wanted to use that term, was all about the similarities. Um, the Kung Fu wouldn't, didn't influence anything technically in the sticks because I wanted to make sure that the way it was passed on to me, I pass on to other people. So I was very av- uh, uh, evident about that. But I did use the way of explaining Kung Fu, the way that the Kung Fu was taught to me. I did let that influence the way I explain the sticks. So I hope I'm making sense the way I put that out for you there. I have a tendency to be quite verbose and quite prosaic. And then at the end of the five minutes, people go, I didn't understand a damn thing you just said. So, well, as you were talking, I'm, I'm doing it. You know, okay. I'm, 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 I'm taking those steps and, and yeah, I can, I can certainly see the similarities there. You know, my experience with two handed weapons is, is limited to Japanese style sword and very little, but mm-hmm. You know, the footwork there from what I was taught sounds very similar to what you're describing. So, yeah, it makes all kinds of sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, what I'll do, uh, Jeremy, when uh, we get off, I will send you um, uh, some Vimeo links of actually me actually teaching. Oh, perfect. Uh, and just for you, I'll just send it for you. Sure. Um, and, sure. That way, I, I, and that I way you them. can see what we were talking about. I don't, I don't think it's going to, I think you, you're getting what I'm saying, but I think if you see the way I teach it, you'll go, oh, okay. So, I'll do that for you. I know right now the listeners are like, what about us? But you know, you, you get special treatment. So, (laughs) (laughs) well, I appreciate that. I'm the one doing all the work here. So there you go. uh, You and I are doing the work. The listeners, they just get to enjoy the, yeah. Enjoy. (laughs) Cool. All right. Well, when you, when you look at this, what do we want to call it? This, this hybridized martial arts mindset that has become you, you yeah. know, these various influences that you have. Yep. It's pretty clear how important your, your father was. I mean, he started you and, and, and gave you this foundation and, and you've added to it and expanded it. But what would you want to add on? If there was someone that you could train with that you haven't, who would that be? Um, you mean living or dead or just living? Living or dead, anywhere in the world, anywhere in time. Um, my, my dad was very much influenced by Jack Dempsey. Hmm. Okay. Um, so I would say probably Jack Dempsey um, for a couple of reasons. One, because of my dad's movement was very much like Jack Dempsey because he was, he was a big Jack, Jack Dempsey fan plus of, because of the boxing. But also um, Jack Dempsey was quite an interesting person because I don't know, a lot of people know this, but you know, I believe he was in the Coast Guard if I'm not mistaken. Now, I could be mistaken about that. And if I am, I apologize. But I know he was in service um, in some form. And I think it was the Coast Guard. But he taught a lot of self-defense stuff. It wasn't just boxing. It was, you know, knees and elbows and and whatnot. Um, So he was very, very well-rounded. And um, I think he would just be an amazing person to train with simply because he's almost... Uh, what I would say a similar thing to what I do is the fact that he's got the boxing, but then on the other side of the coin, he had, you know, the other fighting techniques that were, if you want to call them street or, you know, um, a little more lower body and upper body because with the, with the knees and the, and the strikes and the elbows and whatnot. So I think he would be an amazing person to train with. I, I would love to talk to him about his mindset because um, he had that ever forward kind of attack. Um, and you know, my dad used to teach me the sticks. He always would say that phrase ever forward, ever forward. So, I mean, just on that alone, I think that would be my choice. I would love to, to have trained with him and just to pick his brain and just to see how he saw the, the martial world and, uh, and to see how he would approach it. So that would be my answer. Nice. I'm sure from your time training and traveling, teaching, you know, whether that's your own students or seminars, you've got a lot of stories. Uh, what's your, (laughs) what's your, what's your favorite one? You know, it can be, it can be sad. It can be happy. It can be funny. You know, just, 
I love the stories that martial artists have. And that's really the root of this show is I just wanted an excuse to get people to tell me their stories. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what's, um, what's yours? Wow. Can I get a tone for the story? Do you want a story of me learning from someone or do you want me teaching someone or? The one that, so here, here's the setup. You know, you, you and I are at a barbecue and we find out that we're both martial artists. Mm -hmm. and we're sharing a beer or whiskey or whatever. Okay. And I tell you, you know, about the ridiculous time that Bill Wallace kicked me in the ear and said some horribly inappropriate things. Bill Wallace kicked you in the ear too? After. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I, won't, I cannot repeat what he said on the air because it's, it's that terrible. But and, and I'll tell you after. But so he he so there's that story. And and you're trying to meet me or one up me with one of your ridiculous or fun or impressive stories from your time. So what would that story be? Um, well, first of all, just let me say that I, too, have been kicked in the ear by Mr. Wallace. So it's a great club to be in, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. He yeah, I was in I was in Quebec at uh, Capital Concord. I was teaching there and it was the first time I met him. And amazing man. Don't get me wrong. But yeah, he just targeted me for the whole weekend. I don't know what I did, but he would not leave me alone. And, you know, the sick part of me kind of liked the attention, but man, it was, uh, it was an interesting thing. So I just wanted to say, we have that, we have that to share, you and I. I just wanted to say that. Well, that's, I, <laughs> I, I, I train with Mr. Wallace now. Okay. Uh, you know, I don't know if he remembers me, but if you, if you, if you say my name. He probably does. In Quebec, uh, Capital Conquest. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can see if he remembers me, he might not. But. I bet he does because he, I, I've seen his memory in action and, and it, it is, it is impressive. The, the, and this is, this is for you as well as everyone else listening. When he pulls someone up, he's gotten very good over his years at identifying who is going to be a great training partner, a great Uki, someone who will play along, who has the right sense of humor, but also has enough skill for him to work with in his demonstration. So it is an amazing compliment across multiple factors when he pulls you up. Yeah. Oh, well, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, as you should, as you should. <laughs> um, man, it's, I mean, there's two stories that I, I love to tell only because um, I think they really shaped me as, as the instructor that I am. So maybe that is, something you're you're interested in um and it's interesting because like i said i have my two main instructors i have my dad and i have sifu lore and i have kind of one story from each so would you like me just to pick one or you can tell both okay the first is is my dad um and this was when i was young and i never forgot this because i thought at that moment he was the meanest man in the world and then looking back on it now it's an amazing thing but um, I was in elementary school. I believe I was in grade four, maybe grade five. And for some reason, and uh, a little bit about me for people, cause people don't know me. My mom's like, you know, four foot 11. My dad was five foot three. So I'm five foot four. So I'm a giant in my family. But anyway, um, so I was little, I was a really little kid. So grade four, grade five. And for some reason, this kid in grade eight just didn't like me and was gonna you know give me some grief uh after school um but i was fast like i could run really really fast so school ended the bell rang and off, off i went i lived you know about six six blocks from the school so i i was like full out sprint jesse owens would have been looking at me going not bad like i was gone <laughs> and um i got home and he couldn't catch me he was close but he didn't catch me i got in and my dad was home and he shouldn't have been, but he was home because he got rained out. Because like I said, he was an iron worker. And if the weather's too, uh, too, uh, too rough, they don't, they don't connect the beam up high. So he was home early. I came in huffing and puffing. He asked me what happened. And I said, oh, this bully at school wanted to beat me up. But don't worry, I got away. And without a word, he got up. He grabbed me by the back of the head. Took me outside where the bully was still there. Made me stand up to this guy. And of course, I got my butt handed to me. Um, and when my dad figured that I had enough, he stopped it and took me in. And I felt so betrayed, and so angry that my dad would do that to me. 
And he just looked at me and said, you run today, you're going to run tomorrow, you're going to run for the rest of your life. No running. And in retrospect now, I think that was something that I took very, very literally, and it has shaped me to who I am. Um, and though I hated it at the time, I think I'm probably the most grateful for that lesson than all the lessons he's ever taught me. Um, so that's the story about my dad. And not funny or, or humorous, but life-changing. Um, and for Sifu Lor, um, do you remember in China when they had the Tiananmen Square stuff going on? Oh, absolutely. Well, they had a big vigil in Toronto, which is where, the, where I train, where the club is. And um, Toronto is interesting because it, it has a number of Chinatowns. It's not just one Chinatown. Toronto has a bunch of them. They kind of pop up. But the main ones are in Spadina and Dundas. And the old Chinatown, and again, people who don't know Toronto, this is not really going to be a good reference, but it's close to where City Hall is. And it's called Old Chinatown. And, and in the 80s, it was, it was slowly shrinking. And the big Chinatown, about uh, 10 blocks away in a place called Spadina Dundas, was growing to be the main, main Chinatown. But anyway, they were having a big vigil at the City Hall for the Tiananmen Square. And the... Uh, Chinese community, because our club was so involved in the Chinese community, they hired us to do kind of crowd control because they're expecting a lot of people and they expected to be passionate. So we were there. I didn't want to say security, but that's technically what we were, right? But we were there just to make sure that nothing got out of hand. So Sifu, you know, got us all together. We all went down and there was a lot of people there. It was a big, big gathering. Everybody had candles and whatnot. And so, you know, and at this, at this point, I'm like late teens, early 20s, right? Uh, and we all were. We're all like young, young studs, <laughs> right? Young bucks. So we're all, we're all uh, spaced around this one section, and the speeches start, and this one guy in the crowd starts to get really passionate and wants to go up and speak. So he tries to push his way up to the stage, and, you know, Sifu was sitting there, and, and he loved his uh, Tim Hortons coffee. As it's a rule in Canada. You have to love your Tim Hortons coffee. So, yeah. um, but anyway, he was having his coffee and um, this guy was really, really passionate. He's like, I want to go up there and speak. He's saying this in Chinese, but I didn't know what he was saying, but I could tell by his body language, he was getting very, very aggressive. So here are all of us, these young bucks, you know, full of piss and vinegar. We do Kung Fu. We're awesome. We're going to just, you know, we're, we're just going to be right out of the movies. We're going to take care of this. Steve walked up to the guy, and at this time, he would probably be late 70s, maybe early 80s, Steve Lord. Walked up, and he has his coffee in one hand, and he's like, look, you can't go up. And, uh, and the guy just made this rushing motion. And to be honest, to this day, I blinked, and Steve threw this uppercut out of nowhere, just enough to knock the guy down. And... And it, did, it diffused the situation. And like, it was just, it was an amazing thing because he just gave him this, this uppercut out of nowhere. The guy went down. And while the guy's falling, Steve was trying to explain to him, look, you can't go up there. He's still trying to explain to him after he just popped him. So anyway, it diffused to take the guy away and whatnot. And we were standing there feeling like the, you know, the most useless people in the world, like our Sifu, who's, you know, not exactly a young person took care of this guy. All these young guys are standing around, didn't know what happened. And we looked over and I went, I went over and I said, Steve was so sorry that we didn't do it. He goes, ah, ah, you know, I'm not a master. Ah, I'm not a Kung Fu master. And we were like, looking at him like, what are you talking about? He goes, I spilled my coffee. <laughs> if I was a real Kung Fu master, I wouldn't have spilled a drop. Ah, I'm not a master. Uh, he was just shaking his head. And I found that to be the funniest thing because um, it really, uh, it set the tone for Sifu because, I mean, when I joined, and it was a traditional Kung Fu club, he told me to call him Jimmy. His, uh, his English name was Jimmy Lore. His uh, Chinese name was Lore Ging Hong. And I did it for about a year, and then I just, it didn't feel right, so I started calling him Sifu. But his attitude towards titles really affected me so like i even though i have a sifu title i don't really make people call me that 
And I think I get it from that story just because he was so innocently casual about, ah, I'm not a master. I spilled my coffee. I just, I'll never, I, I, I close my eyes. I can still see it happening. And it really uh, impacted me as a, as a martial arts instructor because his honesty about it was, uh, was humorous, but at the same time, it, it was such a, a raw honesty that I think it really, it, it really affected me as an instructor where I didn't get so hung up on, on the titles and I didn't get so hung up on uh, being perfect. I got more about the execution and if a technique is meant that you don't get punched and you do it, but it's not the way that you learned it, but you still don't get punched, it's a good technique. It worked. So I kind of, you know, use that story to, to justify or explain how I kind of approach sometimes when I teach, where if in the heat of the moment something changes, at least, you know, it still worked for you, you know? Right. So, mm. yeah. Those are two great stories. Oh, okay. I didn't, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if they knocked it out of the park. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. Yeah. So one was, um, you know, one was a life lesson for me and the other was a lesson on, you know, humility and, and, the, and casualness of the etiquette of the title, I guess you could class it as that theme. <laughs> <laughs> Undoubtedly. Yeah. Now what, what's keeping you motivated? What are you looking forward to, you know, as you, you look out over life? You know, I'm assuming you're not planning to stop training. Um, no, I, I, um, I, had to, uh, I had to stop uh, training um, for a number of years. Um, in uh, 2012, 2013, um, I had, um, it's, her, it's, it's nothing to do with uh, training. It's not a training injury. It's more uh, hereditary. But my shoulders, um, I had this thing called frozen shoulder. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. I, 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 I got it in my left shoulder, and then, it, and then I got it in my right shoulder. But I had it really bad. Um, but it is genetic. My dad had it in his elbow. He got frozen elbow when he was older. And what, what happened was it came out of nowhere. And, I mean, nobody – I went to every person you could think of, and no one really knows what causes it. They have theories. But I woke up with it one day. I just woke up with it and I had it. I went to bed feeling fine. I woke up the next day and my, my left shoulder, I could barely lift my arm. And it was really, uh, it was really debilitating and I couldn't teach. So I had to, you know, I thought actually my teaching was over. I thought my career was over because I couldn't do much with it. And then, you know, they say it can last any t anywhere from a month to two years. And um, mine lasted the full two because my body's that way. Um, but, um, it started to, to loosen up and when I, I mean, I went to rehab and stuff and it did help a bit, but teach was really tough. And then as the left one was getting better, it, better, it actually moved over into my right. I had to deal with that on my right. So I only till recently, like in the last year and a half, have I really started teaching again. So I haven't, I didn't do a lot of physical stuff because I couldn't move. So I gained a lot of weight. Um, and I'm still not happy with where my weight is. So what I'm looking forward to now is my shoulders are, are still, they're still an issue, but I can teach again um, and whatnot. So I'm looking forward to using the, the teaching and um, my training to try to get back to where I feel a little healthier. Um, so I'm using it as, as my motivation, but also as my tool to, to reinvent myself at this age. I'm 53 now. so. Um, I'm just trying to get to a point where I can still teach, um, do things, but also just, it just to improve my overall, uh, mobility and get my health back to where I want it to be. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not in poor health by any means. There are people on this planet way worse off than me. And I, and I feel blessed that I am where I am, but I'm going to use what I've learned and what I teach and whatnot to try to use that as the catalyst to get me back to where I want to be physically. So that's probably where I am right now. And it, it's, uh, it's been frustrating. It's really tested my patience. Um, and you really try to look at yourself in a different light when you think something you've had for so long is just suddenly taken away from you. 
Because I thought it was gone. Like I thought my martial art career, my martial art career was done. Like I really did, and I had to embrace that. And it it was it was a pretty dark time for a couple of years. Um, mm. And I mean, I'm still coming out of it. Um, I'm still a little. Uh, I have I still have some dark days. You know, uh, when I can't move like I used to, and um, and it's it's frustrating. But there's there's motivation and frustration if you know where to look, and that's kind of where I'm looking now. So that's what I'm looking forward to uh, in the future is just to get myself back. Um, and also, I mean, I haven't given up on wanting to pass the the my family stick fighting style on to the world. I still want to do that, and that again is why I've started the online course because. It allows me to teach on my good days when my shoulders are really working well and whatnot. Um, because doing live seminars is great, but every once in a while, you know, I get up to do a seminar and it's a bad day. It's a bad shoulder day, like I call it. Yeah. And it's like, oh, because when I go to teach a seminar, I'm all about the people taking the seminar. They're giving up their time for me. They're allowing me to step into their minds and move things around the way they move physically, the way they move tactically. That is a huge honor. And I never want to misrepresent myself and I never want to take that time with them and not maximize it out so they benefit. So if I book a seminar and then on that day and my shoulders aren't working for me and they only get like 50% of what I can do or they only get half of me you know, demonstrating and, and, and showing how it's supposed to work, I feel like I let them down and I don't want to do that. So... I think that's probably why I came up with the, the online thing because I can tape it. I can, I can make sure it's edited in the best way to show the technique, the best way I did it. So they get that sense. Cause I, 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 I do it like a seminar, obviously, but I'm talking to the camera, but they get to at least see everything I'm talking about where in a live seminar, if I'm having a bad day, sometimes I have to gloss over stuff. And I just don't think that's fair. If people are, are giving their time and their physical availability. And again, allowing me to step into their mind and, and influence the way they move. They got to be getting the, the, the best part of me, right? So that I'm not there yet. So that's why I've really tapered back my, my live seminars right now, because I'm not in a place um, uh, physically with my shoulders just yet, where I, I know I can show up and be ready to rock and roll for their benefit. Because I'm all, again, I'm all about the people taking the seminar. because. I want them to walk out of that seminar going, that was like the best three hours, four hours I've ever spent. You know, I'm not mm -hmm. saying that from, from an egotistical thing where I want them to tell everybody that. I want them to feel that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I get it. I, I've, um, you know, without going too deep, I've experienced some, not, not that injury, but certainly some injuries that have limited my ability to present information. And I know how frustrating that can be. Oh, yeah. You know, when, yeah. it, when it's keeping you from multiple goals, your own training and, and the ability to pass on your knowledge. I, I, I understand that. Oh, yeah. You know, have, yeah. It's, uh, yeah you, you, you shake your fist to the heavens quite a few times. Mm. <laughs> now, you mentioned this stuff that's coming, but you don't have a website. So what do people do if they want to keep tabs on you and and you know, sign up for this course when it's ready or, or, you know, keep, oh. keep up on where your seminars are going to be. Um, usually well, I have a Facebook group. Um, there's a Doyle Irish stick fighting Facebook group and everybody kind of joins that and anything I have coming up, I, I make an announcement there. Um, I do have, um, I do have a website, but my website is for me as a whole. So, uh, because I, I'm a writer as well. Um, and I really embraced it a lot when, you know, my shoulders weren't working so well. So um, I, I, I write like scripts and stuff and I do films and whatnot. So my, my website's more of a catch-all, but there is a page on there that people can write me and contact me um, and, uh, and keep tabs on what I'm doing martial art wise. Um, I haven't, uh, I'm not a big, like, I'm terrible. I'm a terrible business. <laughs> say. Um, and I always have been, um, I have lost so much money teaching that I'm surprised my wife is still with me, but she's an, an angel and she puts up with so much. 
Um, I apologize for for laughing. No, you're, you're you're not the only one. No, I know. There, there's something about martial artists that inherently we just we we just want to share. We yeah. just want to give it away. We just we don't want to do it for money. Yeah, no, and no. I've and I've given a lot a lot away. Um, but you know what? I that I come from that honestly because again, going back to Sifu lore, when I joined Jing Mo in 1980. It was, it was 80, 81 crossover. It was in the winter of, of 80, 81. The, the, it was a, what we call a dungeon club. And I don't know if you've ever heard that term, but the only way you join is by knowing someone. Like it's the old style Chinese club. They, there's no advertising. You, if you know a member, you, you think. Now, I came across it by accident. And I was... Again, it was near, near City Hall. I was with some friends down at City Hall, and I had been uh, looking for a martial art, uh, other martial arts. Um, as usual, I know it sounds really, really stereotypical, but I saw a Bruce Lee movie, and I said, wow, I want to do what that guy does. I really want to really see what it is. And so I, you know, I did some research, and I found out he did this thing called Kung Fu. So I said, okay, I'm going to try and find Kung Fu. So I was actively looking for Kung Fu clubs in Toronto, and all the ones that I – I visited, I just, you know, when you just, you, you just don't feel it. I was, I just wasn't feeling it. I went to, I went, this is all of them. And I just wasn't feeling it. So I was kind of like, oh, maybe the Kung Fu thing is not what I'll do. Maybe I'll uh, try to Taekwondo or an Aikido. There was a bunch of clubs. Toronto had so many to choose from. But anyways, I was down at city hall with some friends and I was there to try to impress a girl, which I failed miserably. Um, and I was going home. And I was cutting through this uh, parking lot to get a streetcar to go home. And from the second floor fire escape, this, this fire door was open. And I heard all this clanging and banging and, and this ruckus. And it sounded like a martial art class because, you know, people were making noise and whatnot. So I was like, there shouldn't be a club here. There's no markings on the building. There's nothing. But, Sunday, but it was a, a, a second floor, but there was a fire escape. and. It's not the kind that you have to pull down. It was just stairs, like just metal stairs. So I just walked up and took a peek in. And I saw all these guys using these, these weapons. Some guys were on a heavy bag. Some guys were you know, doing hand forms and stuff. And I kind of peeked in. And Sifu Laura was sit, sitting watching everybody. And he spotted me. And he, he's like, hey, what are you doing? And I was just like startled. And I said, sorry, I, just, I heard what I thought was a martial art class. And I was just peeking. And he told me to come in. And he made me sit down. And he made every one of his students do a form for me to show what he taught. You know, I mean, you got to understand, I was like, in my teens, my hair was long. I looked like a real punk, really, <laughs> for lack of a better term. And I couldn't believe that he made all his students do a form for me. And I was sold. And I said, I want to join. So I showed up the next day. And I was like, you know, the average price back then when I had searched all the other clubs, and again, this is in the 80s, was about 65 to 70 a month to be a member. And he charged me $10. And I was like, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, okay. So I gave him 10 bucks a month. I trained. I went, it was opened every day, seven days a week from 5 to 10, 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. every day, except on weekends. It was, it was noon to like 5 but 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. on weekdays. I went every day. I didn't miss a day for six months. Just, it was insane, the amount of training. And then we, I had finished my first form, uh, my first hand form, and we were doing a demo, uh, uh, a show for, um, I forget what it was for, some event, some, some event in Chinatown. And Sifu asked me to do my form that I just learned. And I was like, sure, I'll do it. So that was six months in. So the next day after doing the show, I came in. And I came to Pam and he goes, nope, you're doing shows for me. Nope, you're doing shows for me now. You don't pay no more. So my entire martial art education, my entire martial art Kung Fu education cost me $60. So I've come across, uh, I've come by the giving it away for free, honestly, because I trained with that man till 2008. So $60 is what I paid for my entire Kung Fu education. It's ridiculous. Um, so, Sounds like you got a good deal. Yeah, I, I, th if you, if you calculated the hours of training, I don't even think it's like point point zero zero one of a cent per hour. I, I don't even know what it would be. Um, but yeah, so you know, I come across it kind of honestly in that in that regard. 
sorry that I went off on a tangent there, but I thought I would share that with you because it was uh, it was the way I was. Um, it was my experience with Kung Fu. He was such a generous man. And as soon as I started doing shows, he was like, okay, you're sweating for me now. You don't have to pay no more. So I'm sure that uh, he would uh, giggle at uh, me telling that story. But um, yeah, it, uh, it was always tough for me when I first started teaching, even when I, like I taught women self-defense and whatnot, it was so f hard for me to take their money. It was, it was, it almost felt criminal because I was so used to, you know, just teaching. Right. And, um, yeah. but you know, you got overhead, you got to pay the bills. The thing with Sifu, because he was so big in the Chinese community, he didn't pay for the, the space. They just gave it to him because it was in the Chinese community center. So he had no overhead. Right. So it was a little different for him, but you know, you don't kind of factor that in when you're, when you're kind of learning, you're, you're just like, wow, I got all this for $60. And now I'm charging people all this money to teach what I learned for $60. There's a little bit of guilt there, <laughs> so, but I got over it eventually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know if I, I don't know if I agree with that. Well, maybe I didn't, sounds, but as far as sounds, my wife, like maybe mostly as, halfway, as far as my wife's concerned, I've gotten over it. Okay. Between you and me. <laughs> all right. I won't tell. I won't tell. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> You know, this, this, this has been a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed getting to talk to you today and, and t totally worth the wait, the reschedule. So again, thank you for your flexibility. Oh, thank you so much. And I want to ask just one more kindness, if I would. Sure. What parting words would you offer up to the folks listening today? Um, well, I would say I'm going to, I'm almost paraphrasing my dad to a degree, but not so much. But just if, if you're taking a martial art, it comes from somewhere. Just, I understand that the current state of mind is, you know, new is better. Everything needs to be updated. But, you know, through evolution and actual, you know, life and death experiences, those techniques you're learning have been passed on for a reason. And they, they, they belong there because they earn the right to be there. So maybe just respect the past so much. Don't be in two of an all fired hurry to change things. Maybe just, you know, see how you can adapt them. Um, and the other thing is, don't just be a fighter, be a warrior. And that's the one thing that my dad and Sifu Lor, they said it in different ways, but they said the same thing. And a fighter is someone who fights to keep themselves safe, but keep themselves safe or, you know, to overcome their opponent. But a warrior, not only trains for self-preservation, but also fights for those who can't fight for themselves. And when you're a martial artist, you're, you're taking on a responsibility um, from the ages before you, from the generations before you. So try to be a warrior and always remember that there's people out there that can't fight for themselves. And if you have the opportunity to do it in a safe, legal way, but you know, always try to fight for those who can't fight for themselves because it comes with the territory of being a martial artist. I, I mean, maybe it sounds a little cliche, but I mean, I think that that advice uh, has really kind of rested in my heart. And so I, I would probably say that is, is my words of wisdom, I guess. I bet you could tell I had a ton of fun talking to Sifu Doyle. I mean, what, what, a, what a great guy. What great stories. And how powerful it is that he gets to pass on something he loves that is both martial arts and his family. I'll admit, I'm a bit jealous. Thank you, sir, for coming on the show today. You can find show notes with a bunch of photos and notes and links and other cool stuff. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com If you hit whistlekick.com, you can sign up for the newsletter. You can make a purchase, and don't forget the code PODCAST15 to save 15%. Uniforms, gear, shirts, sweatshirts. Sweatpants, water bottles, training journal, it's a bunch of stuff. I just added a bunch of stuff last night. And if you want to just kind of follow all the other stuff that we're doing, social media, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, we are at Whistlekick. My direct email address, jeremy at whistlekick.com. We keep it simple. And I thank you for your time today. Thanks for coming by. 
for giving me an opportunity to host this show. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.